out there, Bourbon Real Talk listeners and watchers, Randy Sullivan here with a very special episode. I've been thinking, there's been a whole lot of excitement about my channel and others lately, and we have a ton of people that are coming into the bourbon enthusiast space. And it made me wonder, why is this happening? And so I sent out kind of a, you know, test the waters, and I sent out a question to the Facebook whiskey group that I'm most involved with. Someone say whiskey, and I said, hey guys, why do you think whiskey is so popular? Why do you think bourbon so popular? And I crowdsource these reasons. And so I'm going to tell you the top nine reasons why I believe that bourbon is so popular today. So before we can get started on that conversation, there's some background information that would probably be useful for you. So I personally believe that not just bourbon, but spirits in general, have kind of this special place in the brains of all humans. And the reason why is because spirits were not originally created because people wanted to get drunk. Spirits were created to preserve calories for your fellow man. What do I mean by that? Well, when you are growing grain, typically there's a lot of grain grown in a small area and there's more grain grown in that area than the locals can consume. And back in the day before commercial refrigeration and preservation techniques and modern forms of transportation that could get it to market faster, it was kind of a problem because you would grow all of this grain, you'd eat all that you could, but uh, a lot of it was probably gonna go bad before you could really capitalize on it. And those were resources that your fellow man used and could use and you could use to make money. And so they started looking for ways to preserve it. So first they turned it into beer, but beer doesn't last forever. And they knew at that point, the distillation was purification. You got some bad beer, you wanna see if you can resurrect it, you distill it, bada bing, bada boom, spirits. And so because it is kind of a communal resource, I think that somewhere deep down in everyone's mind, we view bourbon especially as something that should bring people together, that you should share with one another. Another thing you need to know about bourbon is that it, it is a distinct product of the United States and has been since 1964. They came, the uh, Congress came together, they passed a law, they made it so that you, know, you can't import a spirit into the United States, it's called a bourbon that's not made in the United States. And so there's a little bit of pride associated with bourbon in the United States specifically. And historically, whiskey and bourbon has played a much larger role in the formation of the United States than people realize. A lot of people don't know this, but George Washington, our first president, was the one of the largest distillers of his day. He was kind of the Jack Daniels of his day, if you will, although he made rye whiskey. He didn't make bourbon because bourbon wasn't very popular back then. Um, whiskey was also used as currency in the United States. You could pay your bills with whiskey. Whiskey was rationed out to military service members. If you were in the military, you were guaranteed a certain amount of whiskey. Whiskey has generated more taxes in the U.S. than any other category besides petroleum. It's funded wars and it started rebellions, okay? So whiskey has always played a very big part in the U.S. So with that in the background, Let's talk about why are we experiencing such a resurgence of love for bourbon in the U.S. So the first thing that you need to understand is that this is kind of a new thing. Bourbon really started to rise in its popularity eh, in 2008, 9, 10, something like that. But there was kind of a bourbon dark age where people weren't really drinking bourbon. Uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, it was, it was tough. And in the bourbon industry, they tried a lot of different things. They created a new category called light whiskey that was meant to have a little bit less whiskey flavor, maybe compete with the clear uh, spirits like vodka and gins that were growing in popularity. And all that failed. And so they were trying to find a way, like how are we gonna save the bourbon industry? And that brings me to the first reason why I believe that bourbon is so popular today. And that is that bourbon kind of went through a rebranding process. So scotch has really had free reign over the minds of people when they think of whiskey for you know 50 years or so, right? And all around the world, people thought, you know, scotch is a sophisticated whiskey. And people didn't really think a whole lot about bourbon. There have been tariffs and things that have made it difficult for bourbon to penetrate into foreign markets while scotch industry was not affected by that stuff. And so bourbon needed to kind of rebrand itself because the people that knew about bourbon kind of thought of it as maybe uh, not as sophisticated of a drink as say a scotch. 
And so bourbon brands started creating premium lines of whiskey. And that kind of started when they, when they created something called a small batch, right? Um, barrel proof releases and single barrels. These are things that had not been done before. And it was a justification for the brand to take a spirit and maybe age it a little bit longer, but present it in a different format, a different packaging, and to charge a premium for it. And that was necessary for consumers' minds to wrap their heads around the idea that bourbon can be a premium product too. And so that was kind of the beginning stages of bourbon's resurgence. Then the second reason why I believe that bourbon is so popular is that America kind of had a shift in its alcohol culture, right? Um, all of the sudden, you start seeing all of these craft cocktail bars, right? The concept of a mixologist starts to become popular, and, 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 and the cocktail list inside of a bar becomes one of the main reasons why somebody are going to go to that bar, because they have all of these amazing offerings. You start seeing speakeasies that are popping up all over the United States. Um, it, there's kind of this, this throwback to the old school way that things used to, be, used to have been done. There are TV series that are coming out like Mad Men and, and, and television programs and, and, and movies that are depicting a previous time when whiskey was very popular in the United States. And so now you've got business people that are trying to capitalize on that by recreating some of that culture in bars, restaurants, opening up speakeasies. And it kind of relit the idea that whiskey was at one time kind of forbidden fruit, if you will, right? Because... The whole prohibition movement was mostly targeted towards whiskey consumption, and people are becoming aware of that, you know, because they're seeing it in their in the media, and they didn't see that before. So now all of a sudden they want to drink whiskey because at one time the government told you that you couldn't, and so that is you know something that kind of it's going to be a recurring theme as we talk about these different reasons, right? Is the the, the fear of missing out and you know, something that you can't have that you want to have. So after all of this stuff starts to shift and take place and there's a little bit of growth starting to happen, the bourbon industry realizes, well, there might be something that we can capitalize on that we've seen in another category, right? And that was the wine industry had the wine trail and wine tourism was huge for the state of California. And so Kentuckians started thinking like, hmm, I wonder if we could generate that type of tourism. And they, these consulting companies start popping up and their job is to make a tourism experience for people when they go to the distillery and they create the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. So now you've got all of these people that are you know, going to Kentucky and there's bourbon tourism, which is creating that connectedness. And people would go and have a personal experience at the distillery. And then when they get home, they want to keep drinking those those products because now they feel like, I don't know, like they're almost part of the family because of the way they got treated when they were out there. Um, and, and so now there's all of these people that are, you know, kind of coming in. And that brings us to number four. The fourth reason is social media and online information. So in the past, it was kind of a foregone conclusion that most of the bourbon was being drunk in the South, Right. And that it necessarily wasn't considered a sophisticated drink up north and, and whatnot. And there wasn't a lot of information available necessarily about bourbon or its history. And that started to shift as people started to participate more and more in social media groups. So now all of a sudden you've got, you know, Facebook groups popping up and it's very easy for you to get involved in the whiskey community, right? So people start jumping into these groups and they're learning from, from all of these different sources. There's articles that are coming out. You know, there's journalists that started to focus on bourbon for the first time, you know, sometime around the year, early 2000s. There were journalists that started to come into the bourbon market and, and disseminate information. And the internet made it very easy for people to come across that. And so as people are, are learning more and more, it's this thing starts to develop we call FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. And so somebody would, you know, post a bottle or a story about amazing whiskey that they had, and then somebody goes out to get it and they can't find it, and all of a sudden it's a problem, right? Uh, now they're super excited about this whiskey, and when they taste it, it's going to taste even better to them because they just have this image in their mind that this is going to be the greatest thing ever. 
And that kind of developed the secondary market. Now we don't talk a lot about the secondary market on the channel just because it's kind of like Fight Club, like, you know, the first rule of Fight Clubs, you don't talk about Fight Club, but the general basis is that over the years, Facebook groups started to come together and the main purpose of those groups was to allow people to buy, sell, and trade whiskey. So if there was a whiskey that had a lot of distribution to another state and it was popular, um, in your home state, you might be able to find somebody in that state that would go buy it and sell it to you, typically for a premium, or maybe they'd trade something that you could find locally. Um, and these secondary sites grew, but that created an environment where a very small handful of super popular whiskeys could become what I call unobtainium, right? So like the Van Winkle lines, George T. Stagg, Old Forster Birthday Bourbon, like that level of annual release premium whiskey, like all of a the sudden, they're just worth tons of money on the secondary. And that caused a bunch of people to enter into the market that otherwise wouldn't have, because now it's not just about the spirit, it's not just about the camaraderie and the sharing and the drinking and all of that stuff. It kind of also became about profit. And so I don't know what percentage of the demand in the market is profit driven and what percentage is driven by people who actually want to either collect the spirit or they want to drink the spirit. But I can say that I believe that that has been a massive impact on drawing attention because, you know, the, the, the people that are taking those bottles out of circulation and their only intention is for profit, that's one less bottle to go to somebody that was going to be a drinker. That increases the FOMO. And the next thing you know, boom, the market's going crazy. The other thing is, is that there's kind of this um, adult baseball card uh, phenomenon, right? So when you're a kid, there was some baseball card that your friend had and you wanted to have a baseball card that was just as awesome. And so you would go out and you would hunt and you'd get your card. Well, now adults are doing that with bottles of whiskey, right? And, and your friend may have a Van Winkle, but you've got a George T. Stagg. And so you guys are going to show your baseball cards off to one another. And I feel like that has also drawn a lot of people in. If you've got like that collector mindset and you want to, you know, you want to participate about that. And, and I think subconsciously it kind of activates that hunter gatherer instinct that all humans have, right? Because, you know, you want to be the best at going out and collecting resources. And in our modern society, most people don't actually have to go hunt or gather their food. They just order it and it shows up on your front door often. Um, but there is still that drive in us that we want to go out and collect all the best resources. And then when you do find that sweet, sweet berry out there in that field, your brain gives you a little release, right? It's a, it's, it's a little, little ooey gooey feeling that you get because you did a good job and you found something that was awesome. So there's the hunting factor too that I feel like started to draw more and more people in off fueled by social media and information available online. The, the, and, and then kind of the last aspect of that is that as more information started to be disseminated out to the public, people became aware that bourbon was a distinctly American product. And there's a little bit of American pride and sometimes local pride that has driven some growth and demand in the, in the bourbon industry because, you know, people want to drink something that's American and, and a lot of people want to drink a spirit that's from their home state. And there have been many brands that have been able to grow and, you know, kind of get off the ground just simply because of that local pride. Uh, the fifth reason, though, that I think that bourbon has become so popular is because bourbon has been a relative value compared to other alternatives. Now, for those of you that are just jumping in the bourbon market and you're seeing how expensive some of the best bottles are, you might be saying, what? Relative value? What are you talking about? Well, when you consider that, you know, some of the highest age bourbons that are out there, you know, say like a Pappy 23, with the amount of evaporative loss that they experience in Kentucky where that bourbon is aged, you know, a 23 year old bourbon would probably be the equivalent of something that was, you know, 50 or 60 years old in Scotland, right? With the amount of evaporative, evaporative loss that they have over there. And when you consider that the retail cost of a Pappy 23 is still less than $300 MSRP, and any scotch that's 50 years old is going to be well into the thousands of dollars, bourbon has represented a relative value, right? The other thing that makes bourbon very interesting is that the scotch market has price adjusted over the years based on demand, but bourbon has still not done that. And there's also very little correlation in bourbon between the quality of the flavor and the cost. 
which means that even in a crazy market where you've got some bottles that are selling for astronomical amounts of money, and then you've got other bottles that are less than 30 bucks that are sitting on the shelves, you can still find a value bourbon out there that the quality of the flavor and the experience is just as good as a bottle that was, you know, astronomically more expensive, especially when you care, can consider other spirit categories like scotch or uh, Taiwanese whiskeys and things like that. So bourbon still represents a relative value. And I feel like um, that's part of the reason why we we started pulling drinkers out of other spirits categories, because there is value, there is good flavor, there's a little bit of that pride factor, hunter-gatherer mentality, all that stuff comes together. Um, so the sixth reason why I believe that bourbon is getting so popular is because people are having great bourbon experiences. So one of the things that would be shocking to you if you really got involved in a local bourbon enthusiast community is the amount of generosity that's out there. I mean, you'll be hunting for a bottle of whiskey for you know sometimes years, and then you go over to some person's house that has all 20 whiskeys that you've been hunting for for years, and they're just like, yeah, yeah drink whatever you want. And that creates kind of a connectedness to the spirit. And that kind of goes back to the aspect that bourbon is kind of viewed subconsciously as a communal resource. And it's about preserving calories for your fellow man and not necessarily about getting drunk. There's also a lot of philanthropy that goes on in the enthusiast community. And I feel like that draws people in. You know, if you go to some bourbon event and you have a really good time, even if you're not a big avid drinker, that's gonna draw you more into that hobby. Um, and, and just being around other people and drinking bourbon, it, it lubricates the conversation, right? I mean, you, you end up having a better time with your friends. Conversation is a, a, a little bit more freer flowing. And you get to that point of connectedness faster. And so, you know, bourbon, I always say, is in particular, is great for bringing people together. And it's one of the basis for this channel and the reason why I do what I do, because I want to use the connective power of bourbon to bring people together. Um, and, and bourbon is really great at that. And then once you've had that experience, it kind of draws you deeper into that hobby. Uh, the seventh reason why I believe bourbon is so popular is because bourbon is far more durable than other alcohol categories. So for instance, me, I used to collect wine and that's great. You know, you can collect wine, you can store it forever. But, you know, I had a bottle of 1983 Chateau Petrus that I think at the time I opened it, it was trading for about $1,800. I cracked it. Um, it was a great pour. Uh, me and a buddy drank it. It took us about 45 minutes and then it was gone. And the cool thing about bourbon is because it is more durable, you can open it and you can share that with a whole lot more people. In fact, you need so little of a bourbon to have an experience of knowing what that whiskey is like to you that one bottle could potentially uh, create an opportunity for 150 different people to taste it if you, if you poured it out in small enough pours. And that adds to that generosity and that camaraderie and the connectedness because it's so easy to share bourbon. And for somebody like me who's super social and I used to, you know, want to share my wine with everybody, but God, you know, if you had 20 people over at your house, you're not going to be able to really give a good wine experience to 20 people with just one bottle, right? And with the amount of wine that somebody wants to drink or even beer, you know, it, it, it was very expensive. And because you don't need as much of a whiskey as you do of a wine to kind of get through to the end of the night, you know, it makes bourbon a whole lot more shareable than other categories. The eighth reason, and this one is pretty important, that I've seen a lot of people gravitate towards bourbon is for health reasons. Now, disclaimer, I'm not telling you that alcohol is healthy because your body actually views alcohol as poison and it processes it before it processes other food calories. But it is calories, but it is less calories than other, you know, drink categories. Obviously, vodka, you know, super clean, it's just ethanol calories, but nobody drinks just straight vodka for the most part. They drink it with mixers. And so once you add a mixer into it, the calorie levels are, are way too high. Beer, wine, calorie levels are much higher than they are with, with, with uh, bourbon. 
And the great thing about bourbon is that it's a big, bold, robust flavor. So you get that experience of having something that's, you know, delicious and full and flavorful, but you don't have any extra calories. And a lot of people don't realize this. People think that there's sugar in bourbon. There's no sugar in bourbon. There's no gluten in bourbon. So I know people who are celiacs or maybe they have an autoimmune disease and they're gluten reactive and maybe they used to drink beer. Well, guess what? Now they drink whiskey because they can and they don't have a negative reaction to it. Some people just wanted to reduce their calories. I personally, obviously, you know, I like to work out. I've helped in my lifetime six men lose over 30 pounds. And one of the things that they did to get to that goal was to switch from drinking beer to whiskey, right? Uh, it can be a rough transition because you drink a large volume of beer. And when you first switch to whiskey, you have a tendency to drink more than you actually should. But once you get that under control, you can actually reduce the number of calories that you take in. Um, and, you know, whiskey is pretty, or bourbon, well, bourbon in particular, and then any straight whiskey or bottled and bond whiskey from the United States is unadulterated. So there's, there's nothing in it. It's, it's everything free except for calories. And that's it. Um, and unless it's finished in another barrel, it can be pulling out some compounds from what used to be in the barrel. But in the case of a regular bourbon, a straight whiskey or a bottled and bond whiskey, you should be good in terms of, you know, gluten, in terms of if there's any sugar in there. So if you're on a keto diet or whatever. So I've seen a lot of people come into the whiskey area just for health reasons. And the ninth reason and final reason why I believe that bourbon is so popular is the COVID-19 pandemic. So as it turns out, if you take a bunch of people with disposable income and you lock them in their house and you don't let them go outside, they will find new hobbies to occupy their time. They're bumbling around the internet looking for something that's interesting because they've got all of this internet time available to them. And a lot of people have stumbled across the hobby of being a bourbon collector enthusiast because they just didn't have anything else to do. And so I'm getting a lot of comments from you guys on the YouTube channel saying, well, I really started to get into bourbon during the pandemic. And that's the fact, right? I mean, if, if, if people start looking for something to concentrate on and there's this much information about bourbon coming out on the internet, more and more people are going to find it. So I hope this episode was useful for you. Uh, the nine top reasons why I believe bourbon is so popular right now. If you are new to the channel, I'm going to tell you my channel's philosophy. It's about bringing people together through bourbon. I do that because I see a lot of division, especially in the United States now, where people are hating each other that don't even know each other because of political differences or religious differences. And I want to use the Connected Power of Bourbon to combat that. And the way I see it is if somebody can hate a stranger on the internet, it's just as easy for me to love them. I also, unfortunately, did lose my younger brother who was a military service member uh, to suicide in 2014. And that made me realize that all around us, there are people who feel disconnected, they feel unloved, um, and I want to use this channel to help people to bridge those gaps. Those people that, that do feel disconnected, maybe because of you know, COVID-19 restrictions or whatever, I want people to feel like they're part of a community. And so that's kind of the philosophy behind this channel. So I always end every episode with the same sign off. And that is, if you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. This content is being brought to you by the Bourbon Real Talk American Whiskey Aroma Kit. This is a tool that I put together to help all you whiskey aficionados out there develop your palates. You can sit down with the vials and train your senses, or you can sit down with a great dram and break that whiskey down to its components. If you have any interest in purchasing a kit of your own, head on over to bourbonrealtalk.com forward slash shop and pick one up. Thank you for listening.